All right, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. It is eight o'clock Central Time and we are live. I just want to start by saying welcome and thank you all so much for joining us tonight to discuss the cattle industry long range plan and what has been accomplished in the past year since it was released. We're going to try not to take up a bunch of y'all's time tonight, so let's start with some introductions. My name is Jaden Moreland, and I am the marketing coordinator for RCAP USA, and we also have our field director, Karina Jones, co-hosting with me. And we are also so excited to be on tonight with some special guests. We have Kyle Hemmert, who is the current vice president of the RCAP Board of Directors, and he is from Kansas. And then Brett Kinsey is a board member from South Dakota, and Brian Hansen, a former RCAP president and is also from South Dakota. And of course, our CEO, Bill Bullard. So thank y'all so much for what y'all do in the cattle industry. And we are so happy to have y'all on. So as I said, it has been about a year since we released the long range plan and boy, what a year it has been. There's been so much going on. So let's jump right in and get started with you, Brett. So let's rewind to the fall of 2020. The Cattlemen's Beef Board and NCBA announced the Beef Industry Long Range Plan. And after you looked at it, you had some pretty strong feelings about it. And so kind of give us a recap of what your thoughts were and what the CBB and NCBA had outlined in that Beef Industry Long Range Plan. Well, I think it's, a, first of all, happy holidays to everybody. I hope it was great. I know we had a good one here. It was pretty mellow and that's nice for a change. Uh, it's important that, you know, when I read that beef industry long range plan, we were in a time where we had record beef demand, we had record beef exports, we had skyrocketing beef prices, and cattle prices were languishing. You know, we, we've gotten used to that. I mean, the, the whole, the whole main sentence of what we've got going on here is cheap cattle and expensive beef. So I, I happened to stumble onto this beef industry long range plan. And I guess the things that stuck out to me and I, I made a few notes, it's a lot of studying, a lot of mandating, a lot of certifying and standardizing, tracing, increase in promotional fundings and exports, exports, exports. You know, so, so there we are, we're the trajectory of the industry is that we continue to receive less in rural America for the work that we do with these cattle. Our product is so good that demand is so strong globally, but then we get this plan that, I mean, it, it was uh, number, number one goal, grow U.S. beef exports to 17% of U.S. beef production by 2025. And it talks about increasing the value of beef, beef exports um, to the mandating, you know, by 2025, 75% of all cattle producing states are participating in a nationwide animal disease traceability program. For example, cattle trace, uh, more BQA, more uh, launching a verification program for BQA. So, I mean, I, I guess what struck me with it, it seems like this industry keeps coming at the cattle producer. You're not doing good enough. You're not doing good enough. You need to verify it. You need to do this. You need to have written grazing plans as a part of this thing. But all, all we really need is a market. So I guess that's, that's what tripped me up on the, the beef industry long range plan. So you brought some of these thoughts and concerns to the RCAP USA Board of Directors, and that kind of set in motion the start of the cattle industry long range plan. And we took that and created this plan that is they defined core strategies and goals to represent the United States cattle industry over the next five years. So can you kind of tell us what the difference is between that beef, long, beef industry long range plan we had talked about and the RCAF cattle industry long range plan? Well, maybe I'll start by saying what they have in common. The beef industry long range plan was created by people who would propose that they have the cattlemen's best interest in mind. And the cattle industry long range plan was created by people who say that they have the cattlemen's best interest in mind. Two completely different organizations who both say 
that they exist to promote the American cattlemen. Another thing that they have in common is one was created with cattlemen's money funded through the mandatory beef checkoff. The other was funded through voluntary funds that all of us here at RCAF are so very thankful. Without the membership dues and without the donations, we could not do what we do. So that's what they have in common. But that's where the similarities end. I guess I've already talked a little bit about the beef industry plan, but when you turn over to the cattle industry plan, I guess essentially what we tried to do is uh, figure out where we've been, figure out where, we've at, where we're at and where we wanna go. You know, trend analysis, look at what's going on. Our share of the beef dollars falling, what can we do to change that? And you know, I mean, probably the hallmark aspect of this plan is that we talk about things like competition. We talk about things, number one, creating a mandated minimum market. Number two, trying to set our product apart from the imports that continue to rise and then going right on to the freedom. So I think that that's probably the greatest difference is that the cattle industry plan deals primarily with a sustainable business environment for the cattlemen in rural America. So let's start talking about a little more in depth about the cattle industry long range plan. And for those of you that are watching, if you don't yet have this plan in your hands, you can go to the RCAF website right now and print it off or access it, follow along. So as Jaden said, there were six goals that were identified in our cattle industry long range plan by our RCAF board. And we're going to go ahead and dive right into the first one. Brian, one of the foundational issues that RCAF has always stood firm upon is growing demand for U.S. cattle by growing demand for USA born, raised, and harvested beef. Your state of South Dakota has truly been a leader on this issue. Talk to us about your perspective as to why we need mandatory country of origin labeling. Well, you know, it's uh, one of the terms that Brett used a little bit ago was competition. And competition is good in any industry, uh, whether, you're, whether you're dealing in cars or selling cattle or selling beef. The problem with it is right now we don't have a fair playing field and, and the, US, the U.S. producer doesn't have the ability to compete. Uh, they get grouped in with uh, the other beef and the other cattle that come from other countries. And right now we all just get thrown out on the same old football field and let us roll around and see whose team we end up on. Well, country of origin labeling was a uh, talk about a long range plan. It's <laughs> a long past range plan. Bill Bullard was involved back uh, uh, when it started. And I remember riding around with Johnny Smith and, and Herman Schumacher when they were uh, fighting the dumping coming in out of Canada. You know, that was their first uh, one of the first big pegs that was in the RCAF Foundation. Uh, and with that came uh, country of origin labeling. I think it was probably introduced maybe more than once, Bill. I don't remember exactly in the late 90s, but I believe it was like 02 before they finally got it passed. Well, from that time, they wouldn't fund it. They did just what people are talking now. Well, let's just have a voluntary program. Well, what a wonderful thing that was. From 02 to 08, you didn't see any change. There were no packers slapping on product of Australia, product of New Zealand, product of Canada, Mexico, or any one of up to 22 countries. No, it was still coming across the counter. Beef is beef. And, uh, and, and it was just business as usual. So finally in 08, they, they did get some funding uh, to implement it. Well, at that time, it, it was uh, what you call a loophole haven right there because these packers had figured out that all they had to do was bring some imported beef from different countries, uh, either, either beef in the box or, or kill some cattle the same day. And all of a sudden you'd see a label with, I don't remember how many uh, total, but you know, anywhere from three to, I think five, six, seven countries might be labeled on one package of, of beef in the store, which basically gave the packer what they wanted. And that was the, the consumer did not have the ability to choose. Uh, finally, uh, after the, the 2008 deal was implemented and it went through that, that portion, uh, I believe that uh, it was after the WTO had ruled against it. And, and we all thought that that they were probably just going to throw it out, but un, uh, unbelievably, they didn't. They tightened the rules. 
And that was the time, and I think, was it 2012 or 13? I think it was right in there that, that by golly, we finally had a born, raised, and harvested label. And, you know, I, I, I put numbers together from, from the sale barn of what just total yearly gross sales were over, over those courses of years. And, and it's unbelievable. In, in a year's time, you know, you might sell a few more cattle or a few less cattle, or maybe it was more uh, one or the other. But overall, things stay so, somewhat similar. And, and our gross income at, at the sale barn darn near doubled over the course of about three years through that time frame, two and a half to three years, uh, to which we hit a peak, I, I guess, in that uh, late 2014 quarter uh, going into 15. So uh, for the ones that say it's too costly, well, they're right. This, this country of origin labeling, mandatory country of origin labeling, it is too costly uh, to the beef industry. And when I say that, I'm talking about the pack because all of a sudden they don't have the ability to just mingle our beef with all this other imported product and pass it off to the unknowing consumer is, is a U.S. product. Right now they go get a bad, a bad piece of meat. They blame it on beef. They don't blame it on that box of stuff that come from Uruguay or Australia or New Zealand or wherever it come from. They just think it's a bad piece of beef and, and, and it turns them off to beef in general. Uh, well, you folks know as well as I do that our, our herd management uh, our our uh, care for the animals is, is bar none better than any of these other countries that we import from. And not only that, we're finishing them with, with a corn diet, which I think Brett uh, will attest to tastes pretty good down in his country. So I guess that would be the, the basis of why I feel that we, we need country of origin labeling is just to give the consumer the right to, to choose to help support the U.S. producer. Uh, it, it's by, by American seems to be pretty popular. But right now they, they think they are and they're not. So um, I guess that's, that's where I'll... Yeah, what you just said has, you know, reminded me of the argument of what opponents against mandatory country of origin labeling continue to put out this narrative that uh, MCOOL would drive up the cost of beef and producers won't pay it. With what we've seen in box beef the last few months, don't you think that that argument has completely been eroded? Hmm. Well, I, I did some uh, some price uh, analysis for uh, some, I guess, back when there was a lot of noise getting made about the, the box beef price. And, and at that time, you know, fat cattle had fell into the 90s. Uh, they worked their way back up into the low dollars and finally maybe hit $1.20, which uh, that it was through that time frame when this box beef got up in the high threes, it got over four there for a bit. And, and I, I, I would give these numbers to, to the politicians that, that I would talk to. And, you know, they talked about a $1.2 billion trade tariff from Canada and Mexico. Well, there was a period of, of not just uh, weeks, but it went on for months where the packing industry was sucking out well over a billion dollars. That's a B, a billion with a B dollars a week you know you do the math they kill 600 and some thousand cattle a week then packers made anywhere from 1500 to 2000 for a long time and there was actually several weeks in there where they were actually making well over 2000 up towards 2500 or better uh, the amount of money they sucked out of a rural america and took away from these producers that had been born or that had been uh, raising and caring for and feeding these these animals it, it was criminal and and i guess the the laws on the books whether they're uh, too lax or not, I, I don't think it matters if you don't have somebody that will enforce it. So I, I think that we just have the Packers donate two weeks of, of profit and that would pay all the tariffs for the year. <laughs> so yesterday, the, the Biden-Harris administration announced um, their action plan for fairer, more competitive uh, meat and poultry supply chain markets. And one of the components of their plan is issuing new product of the USA labeling rules so that consumers can better understand where their meat comes from. But we here at RCAF really wanna caution everyone from jumping on that bandwagon because it probably sounds better than what it really is. Brian, the product of USA label is still a voluntary label. Talk to us about how the voluntary labeling system will not work. Well, I guess you can you can beat your head on the wall all day long expecting a different answer, but you know we tried it. It, it was from 2002 to 2008. That that's what it was. 
uh, they implemented a, a mandatory cool law, but the only reason it was voluntary is the government through some backdoor deals, they wouldn't fund it, see? So, so therefore that program did operate. They said, well, we'll try it for a little while as voluntary. So you can check from 2002 to 2008, uh, there wasn't one packing company uh, that was that was labeling the imported beef. They just uh, they they had absolutely zero desire to do it. And in fact, uh, through that time frame, they worked awfully hard to get that bill repealed and, and killed. So, uh, the voluntary program to anybody that thinks it's a good idea uh, hasn't studied history very well. Yep, the product of USA label is not going to work because it's voluntary. So um, South Dakota really led the way. You were a part of this last year, passing a state resolution supporting MCOOL. And it is probably what largely directed Senator Thune um, and Senator Tester into introducing the American Beef Labeling Act, Senate Bill 2716. Talk to us about having your own senator introduce um, an MCOOL bill like what we set out to do. Well, uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. I'll just put it that way. Uh, and, and, you know, in South Dakota, we've got both of our senators on. Uh, Thune and, and Rounds both support it. Tester supports it. You've also got Booker involved in that bill with supporting it. And, and uh, so they've got it definitely bipartisan on, on both sides. And, and I, I know there's going to be big opposition towards it. Uh, there's some pretty, uh, uh, I guess what I would say, pretty, pretty high up politicians that are, that are in, in favor of it. So that's a positive. Uh, but it's a long it's a long road to the to the end. Uh, but we, we've had more talk about country of origin labeling in D.C. in the last 16 months than there's been since 2015 when they peeled, repealed it. So uh, I'd say that there's a chance uh, the ball might come to our court. We, we're sure hoping so. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so in this year, uh, the cattle industry long range plan helped drive that dialogue of getting uh, the American Beef Labeling Act introduced. And now in 2022, it's time to take it over the finish line and create it into law. So Brett, moving on to the cattle industry plan, uh, long range plan second objective. The second goal is increasing competition and market transparency for US born and raised cattle. Wow, Washington DC has presented us more legislative options in this arena in 2021 than ever before. Um, but, you know, with all these options comes the responsibility to parse this legislation, and it's a heavy responsibility. So let's first talk about what RCAF does support in terms of the competition bills that are being offered right now. Well, Senator Grassley is 5014 Grassley Tester, 5014 Spot Market Protection Bill that would require packers weekly to buy 50% of their cattle per plant on the open market and take delivery within 14 days. Uh, you know, we, we've seen cattle prices surge some here in the last month, six weeks. And coincidentally, we've seen negotiated trade surge right along with it. So is it always gonna mean higher prices? No, but will it mean prices that reflect the true market? We believe so. You know, the, the concept of 50% I, I would say is probably the ultimate minimum compromise between 0% and 100%. Uh, when we, as a board, when we discussed this, a lot of us said that it should be 100%. But in the spirit of trying to get something through the swamp, we decided that 50% would be enough to stimulate the market to show to show that we can we can change this trajectory of, of the spread between box beef prices and live cattle prices. You know, it's interesting, signed on to the 5014 bill, 5014 bill, we had Grassley, Tester, Hoven, Smith, Ernst, Wyden, Browns, Booker, Danes, and Hyde Smith. 10 senators were signed on to that and we could not get it in front of the Ag Committee. So, I mean, that's a real problem. I guess I'm, I'm still for it. I'm still, I'm still holding out hope that as this dialogue goes on about the compromise bill, and I won't sidetrack us into that right now at this moment, but I think that as further discussion goes on, 
know, bottom line is we're in the spotlight. This is our moment. This is do or die. If not now, when? If not you, who? <laughs> All the old cliches about the time to strike. It's right now. People know, but they don't understand. You know, the American people don't know this business, but we do know this business. And a lot of these senators know this business. They know what the problem is. So we must provide the courage for them to do something that amounts to something besides printing more money. So what else can I tell you about 5014? Well, I mean, I think we, we talk about 5014 pretty regularly. And so we've covered our bases there. That was a huge step in terms of um, hitting an objective in our long range plan. But as I said, we've had a number of legislative options introduced this year. And so we kind of need to talk about why we can't support all of them and why we've stood firm with 5014. So the most recent introduction would be the compromise bill that you speak of. Talk to us why uh, the RCAF board members, I mean, spent a lot of hours parsing the compromise bill and why it came to be that we just could not support a regional system. Well, we had that initial meeting. We had it at noon, if I remember right because it came out and it was hot and they wanted an answer and we weren't negative to that bill. We had a lot of discussion on it, but we realized that we couldn't approve this bill until we got a working copy. And once we got that working copy of that bill and keep in mind, this is after almost every other organization that you can name on planet earth that purports to represent the American cattle had signed on breathlessly and as we, go, as we went through it, I mean, this bill takes a snapshot of the poorest two years in the history of the cattle industry and makes that the baseline. It tethers the, the highest trade regions minimums to the lowest trade minimums. It excludes a third of the big forest plants you know, it, it goes on and on, and, and we, we still weren't negative to this bill, but, but we did, we, we formulated a response to it and asked if we could get, you know, some resolution to these loopholes, and we were largely ignored. So, I mean, when you, when you couple this compromise bill with what we've seen out of the White House, and the White House wasn't all bad, okay? Again, we're, we're doing good, we're in the spotlight, but there is a movement in Washington, D.C. to legalize this market, to do something that looks like something, but will change nothing. And that's just the way that I feel about this bill. And anybody else can jump in if they'd like to. But, you know, we, we hear that good legislation, strong legislation, codified law legislation passed by our Senate, like 5014, isn't going to happen. There's no support. Nobody's for it. Well, I want to know who is driving that narrative in Washington, D.C. I, I mean, I, I, I need to know who, because to me, we're at, we're at such a critical time but we have to get something that amounts to something. I, I think of the old West buildings, right? With big false fronts. And then when you walk around behind, it's just actually a little hut, but it looks great big and it looks awesome. And you go in there and it's, it's nothing. And, and that's what some of this legislation is being turned out to be. So, you know, it's, it's up to us as our calf and as American cattle producers to engage on these things and to hold them to it and to make sure we get something done. As far as the, the Fisher bill, I think that it had five co-signers before the compromise bill was formulated, regional mandates. You know, wh why should a young kid in Texas that wants to feed cattle have to live under the thumb of the packer that's got all but 10 or 13% of the cattle tied up before you even get out of the gate? Because this is what we're doing, you know? food security will come later on, but we have to create an industry that's attractive to young people to come back and grow the food for this country. And I think that that 5014 bill, as evidenced by these high beef prices, 
people like what we're producing. So. Kyle, from your perspective in Kansas, talk to us about, you know, you've been pretty vocal on the board about drawing the line in the sand and not giving up any more ground. And so that's just what we've done with continuing our support of 5014. So from your perspective in Kansas, talk to us about, you know, the, the 5014 versus the compromise bill for you. Sure, so that's pretty easy after being in the sale barn business for 28 years, uh, where everything's transparent, it's out in the open to watch your buyer portfolio go from eight to 10 active people when I started bidding on cattle to now it's two, maybe three. Look, it's pretty simple. I think everybody should try to be an order buyer. I think if you were an order buyer and you had to buy a load of cattle and you already had 80 or 90% of your cattle purchased before you stepped into my auction, how active do you think that person's gonna be to finish up his load of 10 or 20% that he needs? So I was for 100% mandated negotiated trade, okay? I mean, I think we're in such detrimental position of where our industry is today that there's gonna to have to be some pretty drastic measurements taken. And the longer this thing goes, the worse it's gonna, it's, you know, the more it's gonna to take to reverse it. So I was actually for 100% negotiated trade or break the packers up, okay? I mean, I think, seeing what's been going on in the industry for all these years, is, it's pretty simple. You know, that, that leads us right into the third goal of the cattle industry long range plan, which is to reform the cattle industry's legal and regulatory framework. So U.S. cattle producers can protect the marketplace on their own. Kyle, we know that with your history of owning a livestock auction market barn in Kansas, you know all too well the flaws in the system. Um, talk to us about those flaws. Sure. So it's uh, this last year was the 100 year anniversary of the PNS Act of 1921. I wasn't there when they signed the bill. I'm not for sure Bill Bullard was. He could have been. But it took some real big people to step up and say that we've got to reverse and give some leverage back to the producers back then. Can you imagine what it and, and look, back then it was, I think, the top five maybe controlled 55 or 60 percent of the market. Now we're up the big four are controlling 85% of the market. So we're at far worse conditions today than we were back then. So first of all, the non-enforcement over the years of the PNS Act of, of 21 is why we're in the position that we're at now, okay? So USDA and the Packers and Stockers, I'm sorry, I've dealt with them for 28 years in the cell barn business. They're, they're, they're all bark, they're no bite, okay? I mean, just to give you a real, a, a short thing, I've, in my, in my business of the cell barn business, when new competitors would come in, you know, they were trying to get business and get their business started. So I would watch them do some, some non uh, morale things or not things that they weren't supposed to be doing. And look, you call me a tattletale. That's fine. I would call and kind of give them the heads up that, Hey, you know, these guys are doing things that according to the PNS act, they are not supposed to be doing. Well, PNS gave me an answer of, no blood, no foul. They wanted me to go out and do their work of approving what they were, these other cell barns were doing. Well, guess what? They messed around long enough that these cell barns blew up. And then the blood did be, you know, then the blood did start to flow. So long story short, PNS did not want to get out and, and do their job because they probably felt like they, you know, they couldn't do anything until until there was a a big like blood they wanted to see blood before they would actually step in so watching the competition and and we're in a good position now and it's kind of sad that we're in a good position now because of cow numbers but this regionalization and territorial market ownership of areas i mean look at your look at this fat cattle market the fat cattle market at a dollar 40 for fats and you got a 55 60 cent coal cow market one thing it's because there's plenty of coal cows moving because of the drought and so forth. But I mean, these guys, they sure, they, they know their territory and they know they shouldn't step out of their territory. It's going to take a reduction of big time numbers before they come back out and compete and get in each other's territory. So it, it, to prove, to prove some of these things is very difficult, but that's PNS's job is to get out 
do the do the investigating, doing the research. You know, I guess I'm calling them out that they're not enforcing anything that they should be. So a little bit of the progress we've made in the last year concerning this goal would be one, Senator Tester did introduce um, the USDA Special Investigator Act, which would create a position within the USDA that would hopefully uh, take a stronger look and, and have the authority to finally start doing what you wish they've been doing all along. And then yesterday during the Biden-Harris administration's um, you know, announcements, they did talk about issuing newer, stronger rules under the Packers and Stockyards Act designed to combat abuses by meat packers and processors. And so we have yet to see what that really means. And so um, until they really provide us with action, it's hard to get behind it though. And so that's definitely something we are watching. One other bill that I wanna talk about that kind of combines the last two objectives and also this one is the Protecting America's Meat Packing Workers Act of 2021 introduced by Senator Booker in the Senate and by Representative Rokana in the House. And so this bill has a lot of layers to it, but it's got what we want. It's got calling for mandatory country of origin labeling immediately on beef. It also has uh, 5014 in it. And it also has a ban on unpriced contracts and a ban on packer ownership of cattle for more than seven days. Kyle, talk to us about your reaction to this bill. Yeah, so you can pass all the laws you want, but if you're not gonna enforce them, what's the use? The transparency is the biggest thing. For, for me in the auction business, everything was out in the open, okay? It's pretty transparent. You're, you're actually seeing who's buying the cattle. You may not know exactly where the cattle end up, but you're seeing who's, who's buying the cattle. You're seeing the terms of the cattle at the purchase, you know, the way up and so forth. And, and you're seeing price being negotiated right there on the spot. So I have, you know, people think that these AMAs that, that RCAF is totally against AMAs. I don't think we are if they're priced, okay? Like the AM, AMAs, you can talk about them all you want. They're some of the good things that they think are good, but, but price is where it's at and transparency. So transparency is the biggest thing that uh, we need so that other people can see what's going on with the market, okay? If you're a big producer right, right now, if you're a big producer, you're getting a better deal. Everybody knows it and that's the truth. And that's the way it was in the sale barn business. The guy with 500 head who could sell load lots was definitely going to get a better price than the guy with 50 head who had, you know, steer and heifer and small lots. That's okay. But if the guy that has the 50 head can see what the guy with the 500 head, because of transparency, he can see what he's accomplishing, then maybe there's an incentive for that guy to go from, from 50 head to 500 head, you know, with profitability. So that's the biggest thing, transparency and enforcement. Brett or Brian, do you want to weigh in on uh, the Protecting America's Meatpacking Workers Act bill? Anything you want to say before we move on? Um, I guess I'm not necessarily a fan of the senator that introduced it, but uh, I guess uh, sometimes the enemy of your enemy is your friend too, so I guess we'll <laughs> I think there's some very good strong uh positions in in his bill and and i guess uh i'm I, i'm very much in favor of what's in the bill i i'd sure like to get some support from maybe a little uh a different group of senators to kind of kind of band together i guess would be be my thoughts on it okay i've, I've gotten oh, go ahead. i've gotten a little blowback on Cory Booker being the one to sign or to, to sponsor that bill. People ask me, well, how can you trust Cory Booker? And my reply is, is how can you trust any of them? And it's <laughs> important to know that it's not that I'm saying that they're scoundrels or anything like that, but you have to realize all the things that they have pulling on them in Washington, DC, but it's, Bills are written in black and white. And if the black and white is good, you know, and this is Cory Booker's moment after the Biden press conference, if he truly wants to get something done, 
And if he wants to lead the Democrats forward in this, I think they're looking for a leader. Maybe we all are. You know, I, I've never heard anyone ask what the dietary preferences were of the authors and co-sponsors of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 or the Clayton Antitrust Act or the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921. And what Brett said is absolutely right. Uh, the law is the law. You get the law written on the books and it didn't matter who co-sponsored it anymore. It's the law of the land. And we were able to actually introduce our long range plan into that very bill. Um, as uh, Karina indicated, you've got uh, all of the reforms that are necessary to unleash competition again in the cattle market. You ban packer ownership of cattle. You let the packers be packers uh, and the producers be the producers, but don't let the packers be both. And you generate competition. You, you ignite competition. You ignite competition through transparency when you ban these unpriced formula contracts. There's absolutely no reason that these contracts need to be unpriced other than that. There's a loophole in the Mandatory Livestock Reporting Act that says if you don't have a base price reported, they don't have to report it publicly. And so this was a loophole that the meatpackers have exploited by increasing the volume of cattle sold through unpriced contracts so they don't have to report it publicly. Um, and then in addition to that, we've got the issue of does a producer have to prove that if they were harmed by a packer that the entire industry was harmed because of their financial loss? Uh, it was an untenable uh, standard that a producer had to prove injury to competition before they could even seek protections under the Packers and Stockyards Act. The Booker Bill includes that, so does our five-year plan. Our five-year plan also said that it's very important that the independent producers out there should have both the ability to monitor and the ability to enforce the law that was designed to protect their industry. And they can only do that if uh, through statutory changes, that they have the opportunity to recover attorney fees in the event that they prevail in a lawsuit. The Booker Bill includes that, came right out of our five-year plan. So as we look at that five-year plan, who's, who's co-sponsored it doesn't matter other than the need to get it passed. What matters are, are the merits. It's the facts, it's the provisions of the bill. Will that bill actually accomplish the goal of restoring competition to our industry? And we view it to be the silver bullet. They say there's no silver bullet out there. Pass that Booker bill and see what happens to this cattle industry. You'll create opportunities again that we haven't seen for decades for young people who want to who aspire to become ranchers in this industry. Part of reforming the cattle industry's um, frame, you know, regulatory framework, um, marketing framework is our work that we are doing in the judicial branch of government. Bill, talk to us about our antitrust lawsuit and where we are with that. Well, that's historic. That's the first time ever that a class action antitrust law has been filed against the, the four largest backers in our lawsuit. We allege that they have conspired to artificially depress cattle prices and at the same time inflate beef prices. So we essentially have done the work of the U.S. Department of Justice. It's the Department of Justice's responsibility to enforce the Sherman and Clayton Acts um, we couldn't find any interest on in the part of government to protect the competition in our industry, so the Cowboys had to do it. We stepped forward to the plate and said that this industry is important enough to us that we're going to use the third branch of government and try to seek uh, a solution. And uh, we have overcome you know, some very uh, important hurdles in this case, uh, the least of which was that uh, the Packers tried to get our case dismissed. Uh, for a lack of factual evidence contained in the complaint. We overcame that hurdle and our case now proceeds. We're in what's called the discovery phase where we are sharing information with the, uh, the meat packers and they're sharing information with us. And this is going to allow us to sift through what is fact, what is fiction and bring, bring to the judge uh, what we believe to be a very sound, compelling case that the allegations that we have made are entirely true and that the industry has suffered as a result of uh, the alleged unlawful actions that we complain of in our suit. So it's a very important case. It's a landmark case. Uh, it's being watched by, uh, by government officials, uh, the legal community. Um, it is an extremely important case. It is leading the way. It is leading our industry to a solution. 
Uh, it wasn't until after we filed our case that uh, there started to be calls for investigation from all levels of government. And we now have a US Department of Justice and USDA investigation currently pending uh, and, and looking at the very same issues that we have included in the case. So uh, the producers who said we need to file a lawsuit in order to protect the competitiveness of our industry, um, they are spearheading this entire effort to reform the currently systemically broken marketplace. <clears throat> We might have lost our signal. Hold on. Okay, we're back up. So that brings us to the fourth goal in the long range plan, and that is to preserve the liberties and freedoms of US independent cattle producers. So Brian, the threat of government issuing an RFID mandate must hang over the heads of sale barn producers or sale barn owners all over the country. And that is why RCAF has remained really vigilant on this issue. So how important is it to you as a sale barn owner that we continue to make sure that this government does it does not happen. The overreach doesn't happen to our industry. Well, that's kind of a two part. There's two parts to, to the answer to that. And the, I guess my first answer would be the functionality of their traceability system. Um, Cause that, that I currently deal with already, you know, these program cattle, there's people that choose to do it. They do it because they want to get a premium for their cattle. Uh, we sell these cattle as NHTC verified, the non-hormone cattle. They got to have a third party. Uh, they got to have a button in the ear. And they basically got a lot of hoops to jump through. But they're choosing to do that because at the end of the day, they're hoping to, to get a profit. You know, they're hoping to net at the end of the day with what the expenses are. Uh, they're, they're hoping to make money above that to make it worthwhile to be in the program. So then you go to the handling of them through the livestock market. So the cattle are tagged at home and they get on a truck and they come to Fort Pier Livestock. From that time, they go through the ring, we sell them, and then they got to go through the vet shed again. And, you know, different sets of cattle, it varies. I don't know if it has to do with the different tagging. Uh, maybe the guy that was squeezing the button. I don't know, but you, you might have none that lose a button out of a load of cattle. We've had as many as five or six, and that's out of one load. So you'll get a customer that'll bring you five, six, seven hundred of these NHTC cattle. That guy's usually a little crabby at the end because he might have, it's, it's just like having pregged open heifers and they find two bread. Well, you pull them off and sell them at the end. That's basically what happens with these program cattle. By the time that the vet has processed them and they get them sorted off, well, they basically come through at the end and they take a discount for the ones that, that lost their, their button. But the only reason I bring that up is just to give you the functionality of this tag is, is a long ways from perfect. Uh, we've had issues where tags had no number. The, the, the EID chip inside of the tag did not register. So they couldn't get a wand to read it. They would hand write it and then we'd have to call it in. We've actually had tags that just randomly had a number that was not even uh, uh, in their computer system, but it was a number that was different on the tag from the number that was on the computer chip that went inside the tag. So we've seen some weird stuff with tags. Uh, um, it, they, they've got a long ways to go to perfect their, their system. Uh, but, but the other part of that is, is these are the people that are doing it because they want to. Now, if they, if they turn around and force you to do it, you're gonna deal with all the issues that we've already talked about. But one thing I didn't talk about was insurance claims because every time them cattle go down the chute you got another another chance of injury so i guess that was one thing i meant i meant to mention uh your your insurance claims at a sale barn uh go up if you're doing it uh, somewhere off site where they don't carry it then of course that goes directly to the producer but either way uh it's a problem so you've got these producers that have to uh, do a premise id they have to have somebody come to their to their ranch and register them 
And, and all this information right now is controlled in a handful of companies. Well, if, if the government gets their way and forces it on everybody to put a button in these feeder cattle and bred cattle, well, we, we talked, uh, I, I'm not gonna be able to remember his name, but it was, a, it was, an, it was a, an ID uh, meeting out in Rapid here about a year and a half ago, maybe two. And, and uh, we'd asked about the database, you know, where, where, where's this, where's it go? Where's the data go? Well, it'd be in our highly secured uh, uh, brain box of a computer, whatever kind of a storage facility that your federal government would have. And somebody in the crowd asked him, he said, well, what, what, if, what if somebody you know, hacked that data? Because that would be pretty good data to know how many cattle were, were buttoned at certain times. You'd know your calf crop. You'd have a pretty good idea uh, for, for a, a large scale packer or a large scale feeder to know exactly what cattle were out there. Right now we use a cattle on feed report that uh, uh, comes out and everybody scurries after it is, but nobody ever really knows for sure. Well, that data would allow you to know exactly. And this fellow from the USDA, he replied, he said, well, you don't understand. This is a, this is a very uh, highly secure system uh, the, the only way that a hacker or something of that could get into that system was if uh, they were funded by, by a, a, very, uh, a very wealthy individual. <laughs> and to which point we said, oh, you mean like a packer? <laughs> so that, that information, uh, although uh, it doesn't seem like it to the rancher that has put a button in his ear uh, out on the ranch, this, that, whatever, but if, if that's put on everybody, pretty soon that, that amount of cattle being tracked becomes huge knowledge to both the packer as well as these big corporate feeders. So uh, that is, I guess, my biggest concern against it is, is the functionality of the button, the injury to the cattle, and the overall uh, storage facility for this data that, that to me is a, a, a pretty high preference for, for the right people to get a hold of. They, they would definitely want it. So. so that brings us to, as many of y'all know, we have an RFID lawsuit and so, Bill, can you tell us more about that case and what is going on with it currently? Well, soon after we filed the case, alleging that the Secretary of Agriculture was overreaching, exceeding his authority by trying to mandate RFID ear tags for all adult cattle moving interstate by January 1 of 2023, within a matter of weeks, USDA folded. They knew that they had no authority to, to do that. And so as a result of them withdrawing the mandate, uh, they expected the case to be dismissed. But the case contained something else. It contained an allegation that not only did the government overreach, but in the process of trying to establish the standards that would be necessary in order to have a mandatory RFID system, the government convened two private co committees and relied upon those committees uh, for that technical knowledge. And uh, there's a law out there that says that if the government is to rely on uh, committees for technical advice and for policy advice, then they have to follow the law. It's, it's called the um, uh, FACA, the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So we alleged in our initial complaint that the government also violated the Federal Advisory Committee Act by convening two committees that upon which they relied for technical advice and policy advice, but without following the mandates of the law, without uh, publishing in the federal notice uh, for purposes of transparency, so all the public would know exactly what the government was doing. And so our lawsuit continues on that basis. The, the allegations of a violation of the Federal Advisory Committee Act continues. Uh, it was dismissed at the lower federal court level in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, we have appealed the case to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. The government has, uh, we filed our uh, briefs and we recently filed our reply brief. So we're waiting for the court. Um, and what we're asking the court is for our case to be, uh, the decision to be overturned or remanded back to the uh, Cheyenne court because uh, we are absolutely certain that, uh, that the USDA violated the law knowingly. And as a result, they should not be entitled to the fruits of the poisonous tree. 
they should not be allowed to use the technical uh, and policy recommendations made by these two unlawful committees as they continue to move forward to try to mandate uh, RFID. Now, importantly, uh, when the Biden administration came in, they withdrew their previous notice that they were going to pursue the mandatory uh, animal ID system anyway. In other words, we are no longer under any threat of a mandate for RFID. And if one is to come along now, it would have to be through an entirely new rulemaking process. So the lawsuit was highly effective in preserving and protecting the rights of every cattle producer out there to choose how best to run their operations and how best to market their cattle without a government mandate uh, dictating to them when they can, <laughs> what they have to do in order to market their cattle. So it's a huge victory for the cattle industry. Staying true to the cattle producers' property rights and liberties, um, let's talk about another issue where producers have been denied exercising their liberty, and that's in regard to the beef checkoff. Kyle, the Beef Promotion Act of 1985 offered periodic referendums in that act, and we continue to be denied that option. How important is it that we get this program back under the control of cattle producers? Yeah, you're right. So there's a video that I would encourage people to Google. It's in, it was at an RCAF convention and, and the presenter was Dave Wright. Dave was amazing, I felt like, with the history of the checkoff and what it's been through. So yeah, the original, was, as I recall from Dave's presentation, every 10 years, we were supposed to be able to vote a referendum on the checkoff. That has been denied to us by USDA. So another, another thing that I've found just unbelievably interesting is, so the referendum that we tried to possess to get, there's what, 822,000 producers according to, to USDA. So we had to get 10% of those people to sign the petition for the referendum, but yet, I understand privacy things, but really 822,000 producers, raise your right hand if you really truly believe that there's 822,000 producers left in the United States of America producing cattle. So it's hard to get a list of those producers. They won't share the information of those producers. The referendum was all, you know, terribly, terribly tough to get a hold of. And the, and the biggest thing is, is that, so it's been over 35 years. Karina, you, you look like a 30 year old, I'm gonna guess. You've probably been producing and paying in the checkoff. You've never had a chance to vote on the checkoff on a referendum. <clears throat> so we've got all these producers, young producers that are paying into the checkoff who have never had a chance to vote on keeping the checkoff or just a referendum on the checkoff. So that is, is again, denying you your liberties. And, and look, we've beef consumption, overall consumption is fantastic, but per capita consumption has actually dropped. So you're watching, you know, when we was doing our referendum, I felt like we seen a lot, and I mean a lot of money spent by the checkoff. They spend over a million, they spend millions of dollars telling the producers how good of a job they're doing. How about a referendum to let us decide how good of a job you're doing? So that's the biggest thing that I see with the checkoff is just be nice to, to have a referendum and, and let the people vote on how good of a job they're doing. The other thing I see personally is taxation without representation. They fight us every step of the way with MCOOL. So I would prefer if, if beef is beef, no matter where it comes from, and you're not gonna promote my USA beef, I don't wanna pay in the checkoff, okay? So that's my personal opinion, of course, but those are just some highlights that I see in the checkoff. So as we work really, really hard to reform this checkoff system, our CAF has stayed active in two branches of government. You know, the legislative branch, we actually in 2021 had two options that we support that have been introduced that I want to update you about. We have one is um, the Opportunities for Fairness in Farming Act, which was introduced by Senator Mike Lee. And this bill prevents USDA checkoff programs from paying organizations that lobby on ag issues for all checkoffs. And so the OFF Act is introduced in both the House and Senate, House, uh, Senate Bill 2861, and in the House, it's HR 4291. 
The other bill that has been introduced that pertains to the checkoff is also by Senator, by introduced by Senator Mike Lee, the Voluntary Checkoff Program Participation Bill. And this bill would prohibit mandatory checkoff programs. That bill number is Senate Bill 2860. It is not yet introduced in the House, but if reforming the checkoff is something that you are passionate about, I would encourage you to light up your Capitol switchboard and make some calls to your senators and get on those bills. Those bills can all be found on RCAF's legislative page right on the RCAF website. So the other branch of government that we've stayed active in in reforming the checkoff program is the judicial branch of government. Bill, can you give us an update on where we are with our checkoff lawsuits? Yes, yeah, so we originally won an injunction soon after we filed the lawsuit in federal district court in Montana. And we had convinced the court that there was a high likelihood that it was unconstitutional for the Montana State Beef Council, for example, uh, to compel producers to fund their private speech. And so that um, after we filed the case and after we won the injunction that prevented the Montana Beef Council from collecting, automatically collecting monies from producers without first obtaining their affirmative consent, the government rushed quickly to uh, try to take corrective action to convert uh, the private speech and the government speech. And the way they did that was they entered into memorandums of understandings with many of these state beef councils. And through those contracts, the state councils essentially acquiesced to the government and gave USDA full authority to uh, approve every word and to approve all the advertisements and all of the messaging of the state beef councils. And so with that corrective action taken after the lawsuit was filed, uh, the government prevailed at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and convinced the appellate court that now that the government has entered into these memorandums of understanding and has assumed control over all the speech of these state beef councils, then no longer is there a violation of one's constitutional rights not to be compelled to support a message that they don't support, like Kyle just said. If it was a USA beef they were promoting, I'd support it. I do not support them uh, forcing me to pay for advertisements of our competitors. Um, and so we believe that there's a, a big portion of this missing because the state beef councils are also sending their money to third parties like uh, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and like the Meat Export Federation. And yet the government is not overseeing the expenditures of those third party groups. So the, the heart of our appeal uh, in fact, we uh, recently uh, submitted our petition to the U.S. Supreme Court. We've asked the U.S. Supreme Court to hear this case and to um, overturn the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So uh, in, the, in the process of this, of course, we filed yet another case, uh, this time in the Federal District Court of the District of Columbia. And in that case, we alleged that the USDA unlawfully entered these memorandums of understanding with the state deep councils because they significantly changed the rules and, and uh, standards that applied to these state beef councils when they uh, entered into these contracts. So the important thing here is they did that without transparency. They did not follow the Administrative Procedure Act that required them to first go through a public notice and comment period to give the public an opportunity to determine uh, if more needed to be included in these contracts or less. There was no option for the public. So that case uh, is, is pending as well. Uh, and interestingly, the court has granted us the opportunity to engage in discovery with the USDA. So we're going to get more information about the beef checkoff, probably than anyone else has ever seen uh, in this ongoing case. So we still have uh, one case that is pending and moving forward. And we have another case that's awaiting a decision by the United States Supreme Court to determine whether or not they want to hear our case. So these are, these are very important issues for the entire industry. Another issue in the property rights arena, arena that RCAF really stays um, zoned in on is the 30 by 30 executive order now called the America the Beautiful Plan. We would really encourage everyone to visit our YouTube page and visit um, our Mar Margaret Byfield has a video, actually a couple videos on our RCAF YouTube page where you can learn more about the 30 by 30 or the America the Beautiful um, plan and how you can stay diligent 
diligent about fighting that in your state. And as Kyle had mentioned, the Dave Wright video, that can also be found on our RCAF YouTube page. The next goal in the cattle industry long range plan is strengthening the US cattle industry's role in achieving lasting food uh, security for the US. I think one of the areas that we really gained momentum in this last year is educating members of Congress on how policies that promote and support domestic live cattle supply chain, um, they are food security policies. And so Brett, you have been a leader in being a citizen lobbyist. Tell us what you have seen transpire in the last year on the national level about putting cattle industry issues in the spotlight. Well, I guess, you know, I, I started calling my senators and representatives regularly during the time period when they were trying to repeal M cool. Um, you know, your, your first call is your hardest call to make, but you just have to remember that no matter how big or small your operation is, you have at least three employees. You've got two senators in DC and you've got one representative and they're legally obligated to listen to you. So I just tell people to be firm, be kind, but until you make that call, you're invisible to them. And so that is so key in this. But as far as what we've seen out of DC, I mean, listen to this list of bills that have been introduced. 5014 bill, Fisher bill, MCOOL bill, the American Beef Labeling Act, the Booker bill, the Special Investigator Act, the OFF Act, the... Uh, Ooh, somebody didn't write that very good. The price transparency bill that Dusty Johnson put forth, the cooperative interstate shipment of meat bill that Senator Rounds is a big part of, the Prime Act out of Thomas Massey, you know, and I'm sure that was just off the top of my head. I scribbled those down. We have Washington, D.C.'s attention. So, I mean, now what are we going to do about it? And I know people get so tired of asking us asking them to make these calls, but, you know, everybody loves my, my dad's stories, right? But my dad went to Washington, D.C. in 1979 at the tractor kid. And he became incredibly disenfranchised with Washington, D.C. But he said the thing that he learned is the first hardest thing to do in Washington, D.C. is to get them to admit that there's a problem. And the second hardest thing to do is get him to actually do something about it that amounts to something. And I think that we find ourselves right now at number two. Everybody knows that there's a problem. We continue to provide evidence of what that problem is. But again, we have this movement underway in Washington, D.C. that wants to keep everything just the way it is. And rather than fix anything, we're going to print money. You know, I guess my big hang up with President Biden's plan is, is how can you ask the American taxpayer that's been paying record prices for beef to reach in his pocket again and build packing plants when you have four meat packers right now that have been making record profits who have not expanded capacity? Is it a matter of ability or will? So... Uh, anything else I can add, Karina? It's just, it's going to take some courage to get this done. What does courage look like? Does it look like riding a Higgins boat into Normandy with machine gun fire coming at you? No, that kind of courage has already been done for us. It's our job to hold the line for what those guys did for us. So it's not really, even in my mind, an option. It's more of a duty if you want to see this country go forward, because we're in a battle for common sense. A lot of this stuff really isn't that incredibly difficult if you're just willing to meet it, grab an oar and start rowing. So, You know, and in terms of um, food security, we have gained some traction this last year that was some things that were called for in our long range plan. Um, one of those would be Tester introducing a bill asking to suspend imports from Br Brazil um, and keeping an eye on the BSE issues from around the globe and keeping imports of, of, from those countries away. 
where we still need work is banning imports from countries with foot and mouth disease and banning the introduction of any live foot and mouth disease on the US mainland. And so that is something going forward um, we have got to stay focused on. Brian, finally, our last goal is to shift away from global standardization and rely instead on free market principles to drive innovation and excellence. You know, the previous five goals that we have just talked about all contribute to this core strategy as well. How important is it that we stay relentless in fighting for all of this? Forgot to turn the mute button off, but um, I, I tell you what, uh, Karina, if you put this all together, and, and you think about all the things that have been talked about tonight as well as through the cattle industry. Well, one, one thing we have learned is that a consumer will pay for excellence, you know? And I would, I would match our, our beef production, our cattle uh, production in the United States with any country in the world. But to get the consumer dollar back into our pocket is the tough part. And we've been losing that. And I don't think that we want to go the way of the hog industry. You know, the hog industry, the Packers went in to, to take over. You know, they, they basically uh, decided to break them and, and they dropped these hogs to 16 cents and they broke about half of them. Uh, so they dropped them to eight cents and pretty well broke them all. Well, now I know there's some independent hog producers again, not very many, but a few. But even them really probably aren't totally independent because at the end of the day, they probably better deal with the same packer to make sure they got an outlook for their hogs. So uh, what, what turns into uh, uh, basically a contract to be a servant on your own land is, is kind of the position that, that you find in these hog producers, the chicken producers, uh, the turkey guys. Uh, and and uh, the last I checked, uh, there hadn't been a cattleman that I've met that, that would care for that way of life. So uh, as, as uh, the beaches of Normandy or whichever you were referencing, Brett, why, uh, uh, I don't know if you said that in our job, but some days I wonder, <laughs> we, we might have to do that again. Uh, this country's going uh, in a crazy way with a lot of other issues, but, but uh, agriculture uh, is lucky enough to be on the forefront right now in Washington, D.C. So uh, if, if we can't get something done now, uh, we're going to miss the boat. So uh, anybody that uh, said they're getting tired of uh, hearing the call, why, why just tell them to, to do her another 10, 12 times because that this is definitely the time to do it. Um, I guess that's that's basically all that I've got to, to offer tonight is is to keep keep fighting for, uh, uh, I personally feel that the country of origin labeling bill is probably the, the most important, or at least in my heart. Uh, the 5014 bill, even if it goes into a compromise bill, uh, either way, I, I think that uh, uh, I guess whichever version comes about, you never know. Like you said, Brett, you might think you lost, but all of a sudden D.C. works in strange ways and something may come out the back door or we may, uh, may end up with Booker's bill coming with the whole silver bullet as Bill uh, attested to earlier. So uh, we, we just uh, uh, keep fighting and and because uh, uh, if we don't, we, <laughs> you, you know, you know, the you know the outcome if we don't so turn it back over to you you know as we travel around um both staff and and our calf directors and talk to a lot of cattle producers i feel like i have heard one common theme this sale bar or this this fall as i've traveled especially to a lot of sale barns and that is pretty much telling our calf to hold the line don't weaken because this is kind of the last stand not kind of this is the last stand and so um Jaden I will go ahead and let you wrap up okay D Bill Brett Kyle do you all have anything else to add before we close out I guess I would add don't forget about your state legislators too you know they're they might not have the power of your, your national legislators to get these bills enacted. But, you know, most of them are small businessmen just like you. They understand what it's like to have income and expenses and employees and trying to balance these things. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of common sense. 
and they can be a great resource as well. Like our two resolutions through the South Dakota legislature that the stock growers are fundamental in and other organizations as well for M cool and 5014, you know, it's a great place to plant that seed. So thank you. I would like to add one thing and that is that don't be fooled by this little bump in cattle prices right now in the, our market is broke. It's broken. Okay. It's pretty sad. Like I said earlier, that we are going to be at record low cow, cow numbers and that's what it's going to take to get better prices in a time where other expenses are increasing fuel, you name it. It's your, your profit margin is pretty slim. So don't be, don't be fooled by a, a bump in the market when, when the market itself is actually a broken market. So keep, keep fighting. And if I could add, um, now is not the time to be indecisive. You know, we have transformed the ideas of the board that are uh, included in the long range plan. They've now been transformed into actual concrete pieces of legislation. They're clear, they're concise. We want 50% of the cattle uh, to be purchased in the cash market each week by each plant. And now is not the time to go to Washington and say, well, we're really not sure what the number ought to be. Uh, we need to be decisive. We need to be aggressive. Um, we need Congress to act. We need not give Congress an excuse not to do what absolutely needs to be done. And that means we have to be clear and concise with what we ask for. And now we've made it easy because now there's bill numbers you can bring to them. Tell them to support Senate Bill 2716, mandatory country of origin labeling, Senate Bill 949, the 5014 bill. Um, we have laid the foundation to win. It's up to the industry now to help us. That was truly a fantastic conversation, y'all. And it's so amazing to see kind of what we've accomplished over the past year. And I'm really excited to see what we're going to accomplish this year in 2022. So thank y'all so much for joining us here tonight. And to those watching, thank you for tuning in and for your support. We apologize for our technical difficulties we had. Um, we're going to post this full conversation on our YouTube and also on our podcast. So feel free to share with your friends. It'll also be saved on our Facebook page. Um, so if y'all want change in your industry, we have to take it into our own hands. I hope this conversation inspired all of y'all to call your congressman and tell them to support and that you want these bills. And you can call them at that capital switchboard number at 202-224-3121. And one last time for everyone's notes, the MCOL bill number is S2716. The 5014 bill number is S949. The OFF Act is bill number S2861. And the Protecting America's Meat Workers Act, which includes both 5014 and MCOOL, is S3285 in the Senate and H6250 in the House. And you can find a full list of all the bills we discussed and other ones um, on our legislative plan page of the Long Range Plan, and that is on our website. So I challenge all of y'all tuning in, read through these bills, ignore the names introducing them, and read the text, the black and white of what the bill will implement. So for more information about RCAF or to read this plan, please visit www.r-cafusa.com. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us at the office, or you can find your state's regional directors on our website. It's been a big year for us, and we don't have all the answers, but we are working towards improving the future of our cattle industry for this generation and the next generation. And so now is the time for action and the time to take a stand. So please consider joining us for $50. You can do that on our website and stay in touch with us by following us here on the RCAP Facebook and also on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And we also have launched a brand new podcast, the RCAP USA Roundup. And that is available where you listen to your podcast. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your week. Good night and have a great, great night.